third canto, first chapter, 20th text. Questions by Madura, right? Look right. Itam Rajam Bhartam Eva Varsham Kalena Yavada Gatavan Prabhasam Kalena Yavada Gatavan Prabhasam Kavach Chashasa Kshitameka Chakram Kavach Chashasa Kshitameka Chakram Ekat Patram Ajitena Pataha Itam Rajan Bharatam Eva Varsham Itam Rajan Bharatam Eva Varsham Kalena Yavad Gatavan Prabhasam Kalena Yavad Gatavan Prabhasam Savakcha Sasakshitameka Chakram Savakcha Sasakshitameka Chakram Ekata Patram Ajitena Pataha Ekata Patram Ajitena Pataha And responsibly Itam Itam like this, Rajan, while traveling, Bharatam, India, Eva, only, Varsham, the tract of land, Kalena, in due course of time, Yavat, Tavat, at that time, Shashasa, ruled, Shitim, the world, Ekachakram, by one military force. Eka, one. Atapatram, flag. Achitena, by the mercy of the unconquerable Krishna. Partata, Partaha, Maharaj Yudhisthira. Translation by Srila Prabhupada. Thus, when he was in the land of Bhart Varsha, traveling to all the places of pilgrimage, he visited Prabhasheka Kshetra. At that time, Maharaj Yudhisthira was the emperor and held the world under one military strength and one flag, purport by Srila Prabhupada. More than 5,000 years ago, while Saint Vidura was traveling the earth as a pilgrim, India was known as Bharata Varsha, as it is known even today. The history of the world cannot give any systematic account for more than 3,000 years into the past. But before that, the whole world was under the flag and military strength of Maharaj Yudhisthira, who was the emperor of the world. At present, there are hundreds and thousands of flags flapping at the United Nations. But during the time of Vidura, there was, by the grace of Ajita, Lord Krishna, only one flag. The nations of the world are very eager to attain, are very eager to again have one state under one flag. But for this, they must seek the favor of Lord Krishna, who alone can help us become one worldwide nation. And the, the verse again by Prabhupada, thus, when he was in the land of Bhartavarsha, traveling to all the places of pilgrimage, he visited Prabha Sakesha Chetra. At that time, Maharaj Yudhisthira was the emperor and held the world under one military strength and one flag. It's kind of interesting that in, in his uh, purport, Prabhupada is referring to the United Nations and the flags that are flapping, that uh, of uh, flags of many nations. Uh, but he says that during the time of Vidura, there was, by the <coughs> grace of Ajita, Lord Krishna, only one flag. Probably the most uh, misused and abused world, word in the English language is unity and united. Uh, United States of America, United Kingdom, United Airlines, United this, United that. There's thousands of United thises and thats. But it's, it's a very, uh, very uh, um, sort of easily uh, said as a word, but it really doesn't mean anything. It's just one of the most misused words. There was a, an organization that, uh, that I encountered called Unity and Diversity. You've probably never even heard of it. It's a U.S. Um, organization, Unity and Diversity. And Unity and Diversity is the slogan of the European community, which is probably about 400 million people or something like that. So that's their slogan, Unity and Diversity. All these different countries um, 
supposedly are, are uni unified, by, they have a common currency, the euro and this and that, and of course England has dropped out of it. But, uh, but the Europeans think it's just a great thing. And they feel, uh, I don't know if they feel unified, but they, economically they, they tend to be, because the euro is stronger than their individual currencies. So that, that's, that's a plus. And uh, we often see images, maybe some of you have seen, of armored vehicles, tanks, with the words UN for United Nations emblazoned across the, uh, so that everyone can see them across the front or the side of the tank. And they're about a meter high and, and maybe 10 centimeters wide. They're big letters. And if, if, if there's anything that's the uh, epitome of hypocrisy, that's that. I mean, here, here they are fighting and uh, they're calling themselves the United, <laughs> United Nations. Um, yeah. And, and actually, as it is stated in the uh, end of the purport, for this, for unity, one must seek the favor of Lord Krishna, who alone can help us become one worldwide nation. And at the uh, end of the, uh, I think it's the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, anyway, it's, the, it's known as the peace formula, and it, 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 it includes the statement, Bhokta Ram Jagatapasam Sarva Loka Maheshwaram. Sarva Loka Maheshwaram means that all lokas, or planets, are under the control of Krishna. And everything else, he doesn't say this in the, in the purport, but everything else is kind of like stolen property. So they will inevitably be arguing. And even sometimes they have fist fights. I, I read about this. There's a journal called Hansard in the United Kingdom, in England. They have a, they have a, um, a, a, a general assembly in the, in the Houses of Parliament. And they're so intense about <clears throat> what they think. They're not only thinking about about different countries having wars with each other, like the war that's now going on between Ukraine and, and Russia. But uh, they're, they're, uh, they're constantly arguing with each other about stuff, just within one country. There's conservative versus liberals, and uh, uh, you know, like the different parties. So, so uh, one of the, uh, the, uh, ar the articles, where they have a verbatim account of what was said in the in Houses of Parliament. And, uh, and then in parentheses it said, punches him, in parentheses. <laughs> so they, they actually devolved into having a, 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 a fisticuffs over, over, you know, they were so intense about this part of London being in that part of London and not being conservative and being, uh, being uh, liberal and that sort of thing. One of the most liberal uh, partisans in, in England was John Stuart Mill and the, the uh, very conservative universities in the United States, like Baylor, which is a, I think it was a Baptist, I don't know if it still is, university in Texas. Uh, they had their students read the, the, uh, the writings of John Stuart Mill because they wanted them to learn what the opposition, so-called opposition, the liberals, had to say uh, so that they could combat them nicely. So this is all, also always going on, the liberals versus the conservatives. And it was going on even in the, in, it even goes on in ISKCON. There's very liberal people that say we can wear any kind of clothes all the time, anywhere. And there's other people that say that you have to wear saris and dhotis and you have to shave your head and all that sort of thing. So this was going on right from the very start. I was one of the liberals, I still am. <laughs> Maybe somebody says that I have a reputation of being, quote, beyond liberal, end quote. But, uh, conservative about Prabhupada. And, and uh, what, one thing that's really interesting is that, is that uh, the movement, the ISKCON movement is thought of as being liberal because it's different and you can wear different things, you can look different, you can chant on the streets, you can, so that's liberal, liberalism. But uh, actually what really happens is that, uh, that, uh, that Hare Krishnas are very conservative. They don't believe in illicit sex, gambling, meat eating, and intoxication. So they are very, very conservative. And Prabhupada said that, that he was accused of being uh, ultra conservative by one poet. He said that, that Prabhupada, you are very conservative because of, of his strictures that you couldn't get initiated unless you, you had to for, swear these four principles, meat eating, gambling, illicit sex, and intoxication. So, so, and, 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 and Prabhupada said that actually I am, I am the most liberal person because he said, and he quoted some verse that said, Hirata, that uh, people of all different nations and all different mentalities, different ages, different genders, different races, they, they uh, could be um, qualified to conduct uh, 
services in the temple and, and give lectures. Uh, so he was saying that I'm the most liberal. You're accusing me of being conservative, but I'm the most liberal person because I follow the scriptures that say that, that anyone can, can be a Hare Krishna. It can be your, the person who delivers the post to your house. That person can become a, a Hare Krishna. And it actually so happened that when I was in England, and this was in about uh, 1969 or 1970, a postman, a deliverer of the post, he was a South Indian gentleman. His name was, I remember his name was Lakshmi Das Badresha. And he'd never seen Westerners uh, worshiping in, in this, you know, with such intensity and having deities. And he just delivered the mail to that temple. It was seven very place. And he was so impressed that he, he thought, oh, he talked to devotees, and he was so impressed that he thought I should write a letter to Prabhupada, the founder of the movement. And so he wrote him a letter, and in the letter he said that you are converting beastly humans into godly saints. <laughs> beastly humans into godly saints. So Prabhupada liked that phrase so much that he had the, the uh, editors of Back to Godhead, the magazine, reprint the letter exactly verbatim, as it, as it, because he liked that phrase, and it was in there. Uh, uh, changing beastly humans into godly saints. And this was a, just a delivery of mailman. I mean, he was just, he seemed like an ordinary person. He was very dark complexioned, but uh, you know, he, he was very impressed. And, and we saw him when he came in, he first came in, he was just awestruck. And he, he bowed down, he, he offered his prostrated obeisances to the, to the deities. He'd never seen anything like it. And he was very awestruck by the whole situation. So this happens. Um, and uh, there's a great uh, sort of, uh, even, even, even within the land of, of, uh, of, of uh, Krishna, there's, there's a lot of conflict going on. There's people in there that say that, that uh, in the, in the south, southern part of the subcontinent, that the, the cows, that they're, because they're not zebus, they're not white and they're not tall and they don't have horns, they're not real cows. And I visited in, in, uh, in uh, Western India, the Udupi temple. And in the Udupi Krishna temple, which is just near Mangalore, it's, it's in the south, it's, it's near, it, it's uh, you know, very far south. Uh, it's full of palm trees and, and uh, most of the uh, electricity is generated by solar panels. That's <laughs> their, their bow to technology. <clears throat> but um, anyway, uh, it, it was, it, it's a very famous place. So in the temple of Krishna Udupi temple, there's a, a, a dairy. Uh, it's, they call them goshalas in that part of the world. And they were smaller cows. They weren't tall. They, they were only about maybe that high, one meter and a half off the ground. And they were black colored instead of white colored. And people were going to that temple to feed the cows. And there was a big protest in that area, in, in uh, the, the southern part of that country, that uh, they weren't real cows. That only the white zebus in the northern part of, of that country are, are real cows. But the, here they were worshipped, and, and these people were, were uh, going on campaigns. They had billboards, and, and they were having marches, and you know, they're very intense about about uh, cows. You know about the, the, the and, and apparently there's about 80 or 71 different breeds of cows. They're all cows, and uh, there was even an article that someone wrote about cows. The, the word in, in Sanskrit is gao or, or go, and. Uh, and, and he found out some other word that means something like forest bison, if it's, if it's literally translated. And uh, there's, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, a cow, they call them uh, nilagai. And they're, they're uh, seldom seen, but they, they, uh, they inhabit part of, of Govardhan. And uh, they're, they're more like antelopes or deer, but they have the same physiology inside of, as cows. So they're, they're called nilagao, nilagai. Uh, blue cows. Nila means blue, and Gaia, Gaia is another word for cows in local dialect. So there, there's a, there's a, even, even they're fighting over this, this kind of thing. You know, what's a real cow? Not only what, what country is, is better than another country, but um, what, 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 uh, what, what is a conservative better than a liberal? Is a, is a East Londoner West, better than a Western Londoner? And so on. So this is going on, and they're having fist fights over this kind of thing. I mean, they're really intense about it. Of course, that's politics, and we don't get involved in that, but that's politics. And uh, there's a, just a lot of conflict in the world. So as, as Prabhupada says at the end of the purport, that, that unless, unless uh, we uh, 
Unless we have the, the, uh, the unless we seek the favor of Krishna, there will never be peace in the world. So this this uh, verse of Bhagavad Gita, Suhridam Sarvabhutanam Gyatva Sham Sham Antim Shantim Ritshiti, it means there will be peace if we know that Krishna is the supreme proprietor and the supreme friend and the supreme controller. That's what that verse translated means. So there was an instance where Prabhupada took a, a group of devotees. It was one of the early field trips of ISKCON. It was probably in, in uh, 1966 or 67. Um, and we went in front of the, the uh, there's a secretariat building of the United Nations. It's about 60 stories high. It's right on First Avenue and at 34th Street or something like that in Manhattan, New York. And he, and, and, and we had a pamphlet with this verse in it and it was to be handed out and we were all chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. And the people from the United Nations Secretariat dressed in suits came out and told us that we shouldn't be doing this out loud or going up and down and making a big protest about it because they thought the United Nations is truly the United Nations and, and here we are saying that it has to be religious. And, and so they, they told us that, it, well, we could sit down and quietly and hand out leaflets, but we, had, we could chant quietly. So we did that. And Prabhupada was there. And there were about maybe six or seven devotees all sitting on the sidewalk, obediently chanting quietly, Japa, Hare Krishna, in, in, in a sort of a muffled protest of, of the United Nations being a secular organization, being a non-godly organization. That's what we were indirectly saying, that you, you could... Uh, you could talk in legislative assemblies for, for months and years on end and not get anywhere because you, you don't have, have a religious, uh, you know, a, a, a sense that God owns all the land and you're just fighting over, over stolen property. There's a, there's a saying in, in the United States, I don't know if it's in English, if it's in this country, but honesty among thieves. You heard that, honesty among thieves? And uh, what they do after they have robbed a house and taken all the, the booty away, they say, well, let's divide it evenly because we have to be moral about this sort of thing. <laughs> this is called honesty among thieves. So they, they make sure in their, in their uh, dividing it up that everybody gets a, a, you know, an equal amount. So that's called honesty among thieves. Uh, one of the things that Prabhupada, I mean, I'm digressing a little bit. One of the things that Prabhupada talked about the most was how science is misleading people. And someone told me uh, the other day that uh, that uh, these universities, the universities in the United States, oh, I know who it was. Yeah, I was talking on the phone with David Prosta's wife in Boyds, Maryland. And uh, she, was, uh, she was working for a, a very conservative man who uh, uh, had, had a telecommunications company. And uh, then he decided to send his young son, not terribly young, but about 18 or 19 years old, to uh, Berkeley University in Berkeley, California. And it's typically, like a lot of American universities, very, very liberal. They emphasize liberality. They even have uh, co-educational uh, bathrooms in some of the universities. I don't know if they, if they still do, but yeah, they do. And they, 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 they pride themselves in being very liberal and being very open and, and letting all kinds of people have admission to that university. So when this uh, son came back, the uh, lady told me that uh, his father was shocked and distressed that, that his son was given such a liberal education, and, this is the, the, and that this is the, the sort of uh, raison d'etre. The, 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 the main purpose of all universities in America is, to, is liberality. And uh, this, uh, it, was, it, was, um, it was prompted by an article that someone wrote in Vital Speeches magazine. And he was trying to say that liberals aren't all bad. I mean, that, that conservatives aren't all bad. And, and he used, the example of Barry Goldwater, who was a, a very conservative uh, candidate for president of the United States. And his slogan, one of his slogans was, in your heart you know he's right. So the liberals came up with their slogan saying, in your gut you know he's wrong. And he, uh, for, uh, fortunately or unfortunately, he lost the election to Lyndon Johnson, but at any rate, Johnson was a, uh, an extreme uh, liberal. and. Uh, they, the whole Kennedy administration, even before, before Kennedy was assassinated and his successor was Lyndon Johnson, uh, was liberal to, to the max. And he even proposed, and I thought it was probably a good thing, that, uh, that the United States leaders and the Russian leaders should make a, a joint uh, proposal to go to the moon. And that was somehow or other it was rejected. I don't know if it was because Khrushchev was very conservative or because 
he thought that, uh, that uh, Kennedy was being too liberal, but it didn't go through, and I thought it was a good idea. Anyway, it happened. So liberality has become very popular, not only in universities, but all over the world. Um, there's a lot of, lot of protest about, about uh, Russia going to war with Ukraine because they're, they're kind of innocent people being, being murdered by, by, by soldiers. So that is kind of liberal. But, uh, and, and they think that Putin is very conservative. And there's a lot of geopolitics involved in this whole war. I don't want to get into the political reasons for it. But anyway, Prabhupada at, at some point said that science was responsible for a lot of, a lot of the ills that exist in society. And, uh, and part of the, the Temple of the Vedic Planetarium, which is in, is, has been built, although the internal parts, the, the plumbing and the electricity and the polishing of the marble and the, and the uh, centerpiece, the chandelier, has not yet been uh, um, suspended from the ceiling. Uh, it's a very liberal sort of place. And the, the chandelier is, is uh, showing what the structure of the universe is, according to Vedic cosmology. And uh, I have t I've had a discussion with Hari Sori, who's very much involved in this project. And uh, he says that, that uh, liberal-minded people are going to be very impressed with this chandelier, even though they won't necessarily believe it's true. And uh, there's part of the fifth canto that, that talks about the structure of the universe. And, and Prabhupada is on record of saying that, that this has to be revised because it's not terribly accurate. And in 1977, he had several astronomers come to him, his room, uh, to, to map out the, the universe according to Vedic cosmology. And none of them, according to Prabhupada, were accurate. And uh, even Prabhupada's own disciples were saying, well, if you, if you get in an airplane and you, you go in the uh, western direction from Los Angeles, you'll eventually get to Calcutta or Delhi. And uh, this flies in the face of Vedic cosmology. There's a lot of things. And Prabhupada had taken many air, aircraft rides himself, so he knew that that was true. And what the, the people in the, air, uh, the uh, uh, airline industry call chasing the sun when they go from east to west uh, is, is, is patently true in, in, uh, in uh, the R concept of, of, of cosmology. And Prabhupada knew that. But at the same time, he thought that, that people have to know that there's another, uh, um, another understanding of, of what cosmology and what the universe is like. There's, uh, uh, there was, he's, he's departed now, a, uh, a, cor a former Cornell PhD called Sataputta, who uh, wrote several books. And one of the things that he talked about was how the Earth could be flat and round at the same time. And according to higher ma mathematics, that's actually true, that the Earth can be both flat and spherical at the same time. Although we think it has to be, it has to be round, it has to be a sphere, because many explorers, like Christopher Columbus, who was a, a genocidal maniac, I don't want to get into the <laughs> politics of, of Christopher Columbus, but uh, you know, that he, the, he and, another, and a lot of other uh, explorers like Magellan proved, so-called proved, that the world was round instead of flat. And before that, they all thought it was flat. So there's a higher understanding in, in higher mathematics that the world can be flat and can be round at the same time. I don't understand it myself because I don't know higher mathematics, but uh, if you read Sadaputta's books, it's all explained there. And you have to be sort of a, a PhD politician or PhD candidate to understand what, what's being said because it's, it's very technical, let's put it that way, very technical. So what happened is, is the Industrial Revolution, which began in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, um, really made people think in a more liberal way. And, and science, very interestingly, comes from Latin and Greek, uh, maybe originally from Sanskrit, uh, which uh, came from a word called scientia, or skire, uh, S-C-I-R-E in Greek, maybe. And, and it meant basically knowledge not just technology, but any kind of knowledge. It could be philosophy, it could be anything, any form of knowledge. But now it has become technology. And I, I found a quote, that's, if I'm gonna read it here, it said that the main modern sense of, tech, of science developed in the late 18th century. That's a, a quote from somewhere I got on Wikipedia, someone sent it to me. Um, so what has become knowledge has, has become technology. When we think of science, we think of airplanes, we think of medicine, we, we think of, of uh, telecommunications, and, and all, all sorts of technology. And that's what, 
we think science is all about, but science is really knowledge. And if we read Krishna conscious books like uh, Krishna Das Kavi Raj's b famous book, Chaitanya Chaitamrita and the Srimad Bhagavatam that Vyasadeva put together, uh, we see that knowledge, that science is much more than just technology. And in days of yore, uh, there, there, there was something that uh, was called, in, for lack of a better term, the science of sound. And people, now they have heat-seeking missiles that uh, a missile can, can, uh, can find its target just by, by feeling the heat of, of another airplane or something like that. So in, in days of yore, these uh, weapon, uh, weapons, were, which were mostly in the form of arrows and bows, uh, were, were very, very sophisticated. They, a person could uh, just get by the, the sense of smell and the sense of movement, even, even so far away that it'd practically be invisible, that he could shoot an arrow and it would reach its target just by the sound. And, and the archers of yore were so good that they could catch an arrow that was fired at them in midair. And if, if, uh, if they would catch it and fire it back. And uh, there was even a, a, a Danish person who's, I don't know if he's a throw over from, carry over from the ancient days, but, some, but he caught an arrow. There's a video of this. He, someone shoots an arrow, not accurately, but over his head. And he jumps up and catches it and fires it back before he hits the ground. He jumps up, catches the arrow, and fires it back with his bow before he hits the ground. And, and to him, it's just everyday occurrence. It's just archery. And, and from what I've learned about archery, they, the, the bowmen didn't have quivers on their backs like the, the, the standard Robin Hood that we read about. They had it uh, at, their, at, their, at that hip level. And they could pull out their arrows and shoot them one after the other very rapidly. So this science is almost lost. And they were activated by mantras. The mantras were so powerful that they could activate weaponry. And weaponry without mantras was considered to be inferior. And just by sound, certain sounds, they could activate certain weapons. They were brahmastras, they were, they were arrows, bows and arrows, all sorts of things were activated by sound. And some of these archers uh, were expert at that. And they could fire several uh, uh, weapons or arrows, uh, you know, like that, just by, and, and they could be going to their target because they, they, they sensed the, where the sound was coming from. So this is part of what was science and what is now technology, and it's very perverse. Now, bows and arrows are thought to be very primitive, and people are using guns and, and all you know, sorts of missiles and things that are, that are, you know, very, by comparison, very primitive to what was possible in days of yore. And the uh, the uh, uh, great wars were were fought with very technical and very very highly uh, sophisticated weapons that we don't know about anymore. So that's what science is all about. It's about technology nowadays. And Druda Karma, one of the devotees uh, who was a, a very very uh, intellectual devotee, wrote about what he called the knowledge filter. The knowledge filter, and that means. Though whenever something doesn't, uh, doesn't gel or, or, or fit into what the current methodology of science is, it's, it's uh, rejected. That's, it's filtered out. And proof of this was that in, in many museums all over the world, not just in, in the United States, but in, you know, in all over Europe and in Africa and in South America and, and in Asia, these, these uh, finds of, 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 of sort of unexplained phenomena uh, of, of days of yore were, were relegated to the scrap heap of history. They were put in the back rooms of museums and only by getting special permission, which was very difficult to get, could you go into these back rooms and find stone tools that indicated that Darwin, as Prabhupada said many times, Charles Darwin was wrong. And as, as Krishna Kirtan explains, many people that come to him on Saturday mornings to, uh, to find out about the, the affection that the, the uh, Bullocks have for human beings and how they're, they're uh, uh, extraordinary animals. Their, their dung is used for fertilizer. Their, the ground up horns have been uh, found to be used as fertilizer. And sometimes dung is put into their horns by uh, biodynamics, people who make a slurry out of, out of these uh, horns. And it actually works. But anyway, these people, they, they, they're so much convinced about Darwinian evolution they're convinced that, that the uh, bullocks have, have evolved from wild bisons in, the, in somewhere in the jungle, or wild animals, maybe not bisons, but wild animals. So they're very convinced, and from, 
from, um, from these kind of meetings, they, they learn that, that you can actually cuddle cows and, and, uh, and bulls. I mean, there's actually a, a phenomenon called cow hugging or cow cuddling. There's a farm in, in Netherlands that features cow hugging. They call it cow hugging. And it's mostly for uh, people whose husbands or wives have, have uh, departed, have died, and, and they, they, they cuddle these animals. And they, they, it's a kind of therapy. And, and they're, starting, they're starting to do it in, in different farms around the United States, in ISCON farms. They, they have what they call cow cuddling. And, and uh, it's, it's sort of a very therapeutic thing to realize that, that, uh, that animals, especially cows, uh, can, can bring peace and harmony to, to individuals. So these are some of the reasons why uh, Charles Darwin's uh, theory, and it's not anything more than a theory, has been so widely accepted, and why the knowledge filter is, is in progress, and why science has rejected anything that doesn't fit into Darwinian evolution and to their standard uh, reasons for everything. So that's probably all the time we have, and, and maybe uh, there's some questions that, that uh, yes, you might have. Money Bunda. And this, by the way, is, is done in several temples. The person that's asking the question is given a microphone so that the, everyone can hear the question. It's a common practice. So we're going to uh, achieve this as soon as uh, we get another microphone. But you can say it loud, and you, you can be heard in this room anyway. I don't know about places in, 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 in uh, South Africa and, and England, but go ahead. Maybe you can start again so that people in England can hear you. <laughs> so, so some social scientists observe, is this working? Yeah. Um, that when the founder of a movement or an institution passes, then each new generation tends to drift away from that um, original teaching. So in other words, in the theme of what you're speaking, become more and more liberal away from the original teaching. So, I guess the question is, how can we prevent that happening in this form? Well, the, the best way to prevent it is to, is to agree that soft sciences like sociology are imperfect. And hard sciences like uh, mantras, uh, uh, um, you know, activating weapons and so on and so forth, are, are, are more understandable. And, and if, we, if we think that psychology, for example, is a science, that, a, the, a, that an organization must deteriorate when its leader dies or has to become more socially acceptable, that that, 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 that is not, we don't believe that is uh, true because that's a sociological and psychological concept that is challengeable. And, and uh, evidence of that challengeability is right here, that, our, that the founder of ISKCON has departed some 50 years back and yet the, the movement is still going on. They're still singing the same Govinda Mari Purusham every day, every morning, all over the world. And uh, devotees, and there are more and more temples and more devotees being made in more different, different uh, ways that Krishna consciousness is, is, uh, is practiced, including the yoga. And I know many people are yoga students here in this room. So that's part of, of, of natural progression, of, of uh, something that disproves that the psychological and sociological reasoning, so-called, that uh, things deteriorate when the leader dies, is, is not correct. Well, I guess like 50 years, it's only two generations. It's, it's not a long time at the moment. Um, I did read somewhere that if knowledge isn't passed on for more than three generations, it becomes lost. So, uh, I guess Prabhupada said, as long as we keep his books, that will be the law. Yeah. I mean, it's sociologically correct to say that, that uh, things will deteriorate eventually. But <clears throat> the proof that that's uh, improper is right, is right here in the ISKCON movement. And it's not only here, it's in other places too. Anyways, that's just my uh, personal opinion. Any other comments or questions? I think we have time for about one or two more.
Raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Raise it up this way. Well, uh, from what I know, the United Nations is gradually, grudgingly, accepting certain spiritual organizations uh, as uh, non-governmental organizations and, and, and proposing, that, uh, uh, accepting that they may have, they may have solutions to, uh, to conflicts uh, internationally. So, and, and there are devotees that work exclusively for the United Nations so that there is some, some progress in, in that very, very, uh, a uh, political organization. Yeah. Thank you very much. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Um, I'd just like to understand, so things don't get watered down, and yet you say things are more liberal. Um, uh, what was the two words? Liberal and... Conservative. Conservative. So I'm just going to use yourself as an example. You say you're a very liberal person, and um, you know that people now dress sometimes in not devotional clothes, and some people dress in devotional clothes. But myself, I've never seen you dress anything else but <laughs> devotional clothes. So could you make some comment? Well, I think that liberalism and conservatism are always going to exist side by side in, in any organization, including ISCON. And, uh, I may be very liberal in, 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 in one way, but in another way, I'm very conservative. I mean, when it comes to, to Prabhupada's teachings, I, I'm a, an arch conservative and dress codes in that way. But I, I, I don't think that it's, it's possible to climb mountains or go swimming in devotional clothes. And it's impractical, it doesn't make sense. Um, so the key word was, um, you, you're into profit, you're into Prabhupada's words. So sometimes those words can get stretched, so how do we... Well, what happens, and as, as Mani Banda was pointing out, that as long as we read the books regularly and, and try to understand them and go deeply into what they mean, um, the purity is going to win out. And uh, yeah, that's, that's my opinion. That, 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 that is, is what keeps things whole and wholesome and it keeps things from deteriorating over time. So I think we'll end there because time is, is running out. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.